Welcome to Soil Cube's YouTube live presentations about fall vegetable gardening. We have two days of classes planned and we have two speakers both days and they'll last two hours put together. There'll be a five minute break in between each speaker. If you'll look down in the notes section below, you'll see our brief schedule. So look at that for today and tomorrow. And also under that schedule, if you scroll down to the comment section, that's a place where you can ask questions. If there's time after the speakers, we'll be asking them some of your questions. We also will be trying our best to answer them throughout the upcoming week. So do look back there. We will do our best to answer every question you may have. There's also a subscribe button. If you subscribe to that, you'll be notified about any future live streams we do or any other videos we post. We also encourage you to come back tomorrow for part two when Bree and Chris Smith continue to explain about fall vegetable gardening. So as I mentioned, today's classes are about fall vegetable gardening. It's not gonna be about the produce like tomatoes and peppers and squash that you planted in the spring for summer gardening. Today it's going to be about the produce you're gonna plant now for harvesting either later in the fall, in the winter, or in the spring. Bree, Arthur, and Chris Smith will explain all that to you. First, I'd like to steal a moment to praise their books. Bree has written two books. The latest one is about gardening with grains. It's a fun read. Reading it, you'll feel like you're having a conversation with her. It is geared so that beginners will be off to a great start and advanced gardeners will also learn new things to do in their gardens. You cannot read these books without getting out and doing something. If you haven't heard Bree speak, you're in for a treat today. You'll quickly realize why she's one of the most sought after gardening speakers in the nation. Chris Smith's book, The Whole Okra, is just about one plant. It's a fascinating book. Um, it reads like it's part history, it's part about agriculture, horticulture, it's um, part creative writing, it's part personal writing, and cookbook. He won the James Beard Award for this book this year, which is a huge accomplishment. Um, he gave me many ideas to do this summer. One of the most interesting to me was trying to eat okra flour, and they turned out to be delicious. And that's the flowers I meant, not like flour, like wheat flour. Um, Chris is speaking about garlic today. This is not a fall crop, but it's a very exciting book. And um, I don't know, maybe he will sneak in something about okra today, but we will find out. And I will leave the airspace to Brie Arthur. Well, thank you, Hillary. I am so excited to be doing my very first YouTube live session. Thank you all for tuning in. It's a whole new world that we're embarking upon. And it's a great time of the year to get out into your garden and start growing things that you'll be able to bring in and use in your kitchen on a regular basis. And today I am going to talk to you about growing uh, food and flowers in containers so that you can bring your harvest right to your front or back porch and make it really, really easy for you to access everything. But a little bit about me, my name is Brie like the cheese, Arthur like the golden girl, and I am a gardener in the South Raleigh area. I live in a cute town called Fuquay, Verena, North Carolina. And I've been gardening my whole life, but I have been uh, working professionally in horticulture for the last 20 years. And I'm thrilled to be able to share this information with all of you to make your fall gardening experience as easy and plentiful as possible. So today we're going to cover some three specific topics. First of all, we're going to go over the basics for what you need to successfully contain your garden. We're going to cover soil, fertilizer, watering, site placement, dealing with animals, and managing insects. In the fall, insects are a huge problem. Next, we're going to go into different types of containers, including grow bags, hanging baskets, window boxes, and even growing vertically. And I'm really excited because for the first time ever, I'm doing live demonstrations. So hopefully I will stay on time. That's not always one of Bree's strengths. I operate on Bree time. 
And finally today, I want to cover some of my favorite plants that I use in container gardening, including different flowers, the incorporation of grains, because I am the crazy grain lady, and different vegetables that you'll be able to plant now and harvest throughout fall, winter, and even into spring. So let's jump right in. Let's talk about growing in containers. Hopefully everybody watching this has some experience in this and what I'll be sharing with you will maybe just aid your uh, next round of container plantings. So the very first thing that I'm gonna share with you is that I only use soil cube as my container medium. Now, I will tell you three years ago, I was on the potting soil bandwagon and I never imagined that I would use compost in pots, right? Intuitively, compost doesn't drain well enough. It just didn't make sense to me to fill my pots with compost. But then I started using soil cube and my opinion of compost completely changed. Now, the thing is, compost is that you buy at like a big store isn't the same as soil cube. And so it's really important to understand the quality difference and soil cube is it. For me, I'm never gonna grow in anything but soil cube, so that's it. The great thing is it's, it's comprised of three different elements. Decomposed grass clippings, decomposed uh, wheat straw, wheat hay, wheat straw, and decomposed cow manure. And the real trick here is that those cows ate that hay and the hay, or the wheat, was not treated with a persistent herbicide. And I cannot stress this enough. Killer compost is all over the place. In fact, this summer, I've had so many people sending me questions about why their plants are struggling, why they look like they've been hit with herbicide. Well, it's because they used compost that actually had active herbicide in it. So this is one of the most important things that you will learn when you start making your decisions about your soil media, and that is why I stick to soil cube. Now, the really great thing about soil cube and containers is that it reduces your maintenance because it holds more nutrients and it holds more water. So my containers now don't have to be watered every single day. I can actually leave my house for a couple of days, which hasn't happened much in the last few months, but I don't have to worry that my pots are gonna dry out while I'm away. So Soil Cube has altogether made my experience as a container gardener so much easier. Now, I like to top dress with triple shred hardwood, and I don't always do this because I don't always have mulch on hand, but what's nice about using a tiny layer of mulch, and when I say tiny, I mean like a quarter to a half inch. You're not mulching heavily. You're really just doing this one thing to make the pot look neat and tidy. It looks a little more professional. It will also help make it so that soil doesn't bounce out if you have heavy rain or if you're watering with inappropriate hose end, which I will talk about next. So lots of people forget to add a rose to their hose and then they have a mess in their containers. Now organic fertilizer is the way I go. I don't use any synthetics. I'm an organic gardener and I have had great success using all of these products. Uh, very specifically, I am addicted to fish emulsion. I think in part because I like the satisfaction of knowing that I did it and knowing that anyone who comes can also smell that I just fertilized. It brings me great satisfaction. But it's a high in nitrogen formulation, so it is important that you can balance that out with some other organic fertilizers. I often just throw a handful of plant tone right into the pot when I'm, when I'm planting it. That way I know that it has nutrients right off the bat, so as the plants start to grow or the seed starts to develop, I don't have to worry about any nutrient deficiencies. Now, watering. Okay, here's the deal. I am old school. I like dragging hoses. I think there's some good exercise in that, and I think, you know, you can grab an iced tea or a cold beer, and you can walk around your garden and really get to know what's going on. I use a hose very specifically with a proper rose attachment. So what that does is it ensures that the water doesn't come out with too much pressure and, you know, cause like, you know, giant holes in my potting soil. So. 
I always recommend watering my hand because you're going to be paying attention. You're going to see when the water starts seeping out of the bottom of the pot. You're going to recognize that it's well watered enough and then when you look at it the next day you can determine whether you need to irrigate or not. Um, I've often used sprinklers through the summer but I don't find that sprinklers are necessary through fall and winter. Um, especially if you live in a colder area where you might run the risk of having the water freeze in the hose and then the, the hose explodes. I'm telling you this from experience. I've had quite a number of hoses explode over the last few years from me not paying attention to temperatures. Now, when you're doing any sort of container or frankly any gardening project at all, the main thing that you want to take into consideration is that you're matching the cultural needs of all the plants that you want to grow. So you want to put full sun plants together, you want to put shade plants together. This is intuitive, right? But there's a little bit of a difference in understanding this with containers. The advantage with containers is that you can move them. So if it's getting too much exposure or too little, you can just move it to a different area that has the appropriate lighting. Gardening is not as convenient as that. Now, for those of you who live in deep shade, it's not all lost, although there are a lot of vegetables that you're not going to have as much success with because they do want more sun. However, this is a really good adage. If you're growing it for fruit or root, you need full sun. If you're growing it for the greens, partial shade is all you need. And so that gives you a great opportunity to grow things like lettuce and Swiss chard and kale and spinach and um, arugula and all kinds of different things that you can bring in and enjoy in salads. Okay. How do you deal with animals? Because we all deal with animals. It's one of the universal things that every gardener in this planet experiences. So let's just acknowledge it. Let's come up with some solutions-ish. Let's also stop setting our expectations that animals aren't gonna come in and like hurt the things that we've created. So uh, stop getting your feelings hurt. Everybody is dealing with creatures. Uh, there's a few things in containers that you can do that wouldn't necessarily apply to the way you deal with animals in your garden. I'm going to cover that tomorrow. But one of my so solutions is actually planting things in my containers using these Volking bags. So if you're not familiar, Google Volking. It's a really cool product. And in containers, voles aren't a problem. But the neat thing is they come in all different sizes and you just fit them into your pot fill it with soil cube, plant, and then pull the metal bag over so that animals like chipmunks and squirrels can't get in there and dig around because that's usually who's causing the trouble in our pots. Other solutions that aren't quite as user friendly include chicken wire and I've actually even started using Brillo pads uh, because they are available at the grocery store and I actually use those as like a um, like a ground cover in my pots and I found that that helps at least with the squirrels who are trying to bury acorns in every single pot that I have growing. Now my favorite repellent, I can't not mention this, is I Must Garden and this is great because it does come in formulations for every creature but typically in containers the, the problems that you're dealing with tend to be from the small really cute creatures like chipmunks and squirrels. So the squirrel formulation actually works for both and I highly recommend it. It's very inexpensive, it's very easy to apply and you can apply it to your food crops and not worry about consuming it because it's all natural. Okay, what about the insects? I have a nightmare that I'm going to be ground zero for a new strain of cabbage worms that become flesh eating because I'm obsessed with growing brassicaceous crops and right now there's probably a hundred thousand tiny little white butterflies floating around my garden. What they're doing is laying eggs on all of my brassicaceous plants. So that includes you know, broccoli and cauliflower and Brussels sprouts and kale and you know, people who visit often would think, oh, this looks like a magical fairyland. And meanwhile, I'm like, oh, this is actually a nightmare. So dealing with cabbage worms and cutworms very specifically on your cool crops is, is something you have to pay attention to. My recommendation is that you apply powder BT all the time, like obsessively. 
it's not the easiest solution, but it is effective. Um, I find that I am putting brassica out, or I'm putting BT out on my brassicas basically every time it rains, which lately has been all the time. So uh, I'm putting out BT on a near daily basis, but it's the only way that I'm able to get these plants like broccoli and cauliflower to go from seedling stage to actually start developing because the worms are determined to eat them to nothing. So if you're not familiar with Bacillus thuringiensis, also known as BT, it is a very safe product to use. It's gram positive and it's a soil dwelling bacterium. Basically what happens is the caterpillars eat it and then they feel full and they slowly starve to death, which I know sounds mean, but you know, when you're trying to grow your broccoli for you to eat, sometimes, you know, getting the worms to not eat it is, is worthwhile. So it is organic, technically, uh, for organic farmers, this is one of the few things that they're allowed to use. And it's very inexpensive, and again, it's very easy to apply. When you buy it, I recommend buying like at least four bags, because if you're anything like me, you're going to need all of it. All right, let's get into types of containers, because there's so many different options. And, you know, really the sky is the limit with container gardening. You can basically turn anything that will hold soil into a pot. But a few things that I like to, you know, recognize, um, terracotta pots are really great for drought tolerant things, things like herbs or succulents. And they're nice because, you know, they're relatively lightweight. So if you do get really cold, they're easy to bring inside into a garage or into your house. Um, they're not always very practical for traditional vegetables because the, the pots themselves dry out much more quickly compared to, um, you know, different types of vessels like plastic or even glazed pottery. But I do love to use them, especially for Mediterranean herbs, which are very sensitive to wet feet. And so that's what I do to keep sage and oregano and thyme, things like that, growing all season, I stash them into terracotta pots. Um, now, large terracotta are really nice. Um, they do offer you an opportunity to foodscape in your containers year round. Especially when they're larger, they tend not to dry out as quickly. Um, they do need to be watered more often. So my recommendation for large terracotta pots is to stash them really near a water source. Like in my case, this is actually right next to my side door, which is about three and a half feet from a hose bib. So as soon as I walk out every morning, I notice this pot, I'm able to water it with ease. And because it's right close up to my house, I haven't had to worry about this pot breaking, even when we get down into single digits. Now glazed pots are wonderful and they're a great way to really add a pop of color to your landscape. Um, one of the disadvantages of glazed pots is they aren't always as cold tolerant. So I always recommend smaller glazed pots so that they'll be easier for you to move inside if you do drop below 10 or uh, 12 degrees. Um, I really like that I can grow things like calendula and Swiss chard and I can actually keep them all separate because it really allows you to take full advantage of just the beauty of these plants. But I like pushing them all together so that it's really easy for me to water. You know, one of the key things with fall growing into winter uh, container gardening is that you put your pots in a place where it will be easy for you to access. Unlike in the summer where I'm walking my entire property dragging hoses. I'm not going to do that in the winter time. So I put all of these pots in central locations with an easy access either to a hose or a watering can. Now here's just a few examples of some winter or fall foodscape containers and glazed pottery. And you can see like these dwarf cabbages which are edible. They do produce a head. They look so nice with you know, a combination of a conifer and um, you know a carex and and some creeping jenny you know these are just really nice things that will give you evergreen appeal they'll look good through the entire cool season now plastic containers are of course the most accessible they're inexpensive you can basically buy them anywhere 
Um, all of the plastic containers that you're using through the winter need to have drainage holes. You're not going to be growing any food crops in containers in the cool season that are tolerant of bog conditions. So remember that. Um, now for me, I like to do my plastic containers as larger pots because um, they're lightweight. So if I do need to move them, it's not that big of a deal. Um, I definitely think that Crescent has some of the very best containers that you can buy. They are an investment, I will tell you that. They are more expensive than what you'll purchase at like Lowe's or Home Depot. However, these pots are rated to go to negative 30. They don't fade in the sun and many of them do have water storage capacity that has an easy to remove drain that you would want to have pulled out through the cool season because you don't want that water to freeze and expand and ultimately break the pot. Now this is one of my favorite crescent planters and this is one that does not have uh, a water storage but and you can see I'm growing this right off of my back porch and I have it mixed with barley and carex. Now this is carex everillo so it's a bright yellow variety looks awesome all winter and that that uh, barley is just grown from seed that was directly planted in the container and it grew all season long just like this. I was actually able to harvest the barley in the spring and um, fake make beer myself. <laughs> I say fake because it wasn't actually a great, a great success for me, but for other people it might be. Now, if you're really into not wanting to bend over, the Nest from Crescent is a really great product. This is, you know, sits about four foot tall, so it's really easy to access. And it offers you the opportunity to grow basically in a raised bed. Um, again, this has a storage capacity that you can just pull the drain on for the winter. And I grow like uh, salad greens in this, again, right on my back patio so that I don't even have to put shoes on if I want to have a salad in the fall. Now, fabric grow bags are one of the newer approaches for uh, container gardening. They're very inexpensive and they are so effective. I am over the moon excited about grow bags. Um, I first started just with these felt varieties and they came in all different colors and I used to do these at school gardens a lot because this was a really easy way for the kids to be able to have, you know, a big raised bed without, you know, having to deal with the native soil, very, very small financial investment. So all you have to do is fill your, fill your uh, fabric bag with soil cube, just straight soil cube. And then you can direct seed whatever you want. In this case, this is lettuce. And then you're going to water it in once you've planted it. And then really with these fabric bags, especially as the temperatures cool down, you're going to need to water less and less. So typically through, um, say, the months of September and October, I'm watering maybe every two or three days, depending on rainfall. When November, December, January comes, I'm actually watering even less than once a week. Because these fabric bags are larger, they're able to hold more soil, which holds more moisture, which reduces my maintenance. Now, my life completely changed last year when Soil Cube started to introduce these 100 gallon root pouch gardens. And I really had zero expectations. I cannot believe the productivity that I have had now with two seasons of these. I actually got two more, so I'm going to have six because these are now my most productive spaces in my foodscape. And I last spring planted these with broccoli that I had just bought at Home Depot. And I'm usually a plant snob. Usually I'm not satisfied with what I can find at box stores, but I have to give them props. These broccolis were amazing. They ended up making heads like the size of my face and I was able to freeze all of this broccoli and I'm gonna have it for like the whole year. Now, of course, I'm obsessively growing broccoli again because it's fall, but this time I'm gonna be able to eat it in real time. But you can see this is one month after I planted this and you see that there is BT on these because those cabbage worms are active all year long. And then here I am, I harvested 48 heads of broccoli. My recommendation, 
with growing heading vegetables, and I'm gonna talk about this more tomorrow, is to not plant them all at one time because then you are having to harvest 48 heads at once. Instead, think about succession planting. So, you know, maybe every two weeks, plant a new batch into a different container or a different area of your garden. That way you're able to extend the harvestable, uh, harvestability time. Unless you wanna be like me and, and, and do a lot of canning and freezing. Now, hanging baskets are a thing that I have generally not done a great job with, especially traditional hanging baskets that need a ton of water. So I started using herbs in my hanging baskets, and that's a really nice thing because, you know, you have them on your front porch, you have a roof over it, it's not getting rained on, those Mediterranean plants don't necessarily like the conditions of the southeast. But then I discovered another really cool thing to do, especially to engage kids, using hanging baskets is to basically create salad bowls and i want to give you a demonstration of this so this is such an easy project and everybody can do this so you just get your soil cube and you get your container and then you just simply sprinkle whatever kind of lettuce you want to grow right on top this is a nice mi mix. It's called the Gourmet Mix from Burpee. And it's gonna give me really nice color. You wanna have good coverage of your soil so that you can just come in with a pair of scissors and harvest salads directly from this. And now you're just gonna add a light layer of soil cube right on top to make sure that that seed has good contact with the soil. So a little bit like that. You're gonna water it in, and then literally 30 days later, what you have is salad ready to be harvested. Now, the advantage of doing this with leaf lettuce is that you can keep harvesting it all season. So I'm very specific in that I grow leaf lettuce in these rather than heading lettuce. My first demo complete. <laughs> Now, some other really fun things that you can use to create foodscapes for the fall include feed tanks. Now, I'm basically obsessed with feed tanks. They're inexpensive, they're easy to buy. Basically, every tractor supply in America sells feed tanks. They are all different sizes. The key here is to fill them with soil cube. And once you've done that, you're gonna be able to reuse that container for season after season after season. So you can see, uh, you know, this is an ideal way to grow cool season vegetables. And if you do get really cold, it's quite easy just to layer, you know, even a sheet or a piece of remay to be able to help protect these plants if temperatures start to plummet. But now we love feed tanks so much at my house that we actually inserted one into the ground and we use it as a swimming pool. And you know what? Sometimes you've just got to own it. It's hot out, it's nice to sit in a, in a tank of water, and I can plant a foodscape surrounding that feed tank and it looks super cool all season long. Now window boxes, you know, whenever I go to Charleston, I'm always super jealous of the window boxes I see, and I try and replicate what I see there at my own house. And one of the things with window boxes, you really do have an advantage of placing these near a water source or having them hooked up to an irrigation cycle. Window boxes tend to be really small, so they dry out more quickly. And that can be a challenge, especially through the summer. However, in the cool season, these plants will require less water. So I usually only grow succulents in my window boxes in the summer, but then I replace them with fun things like mustard and lettuce and Swiss chard. And then I add things like carex, and I even decorate them up for the holiday season using cut branches of magnolia and hydrangeas and even, you know, some swaths of grains. Now, most people are curious about growing vertically but haven't actually done it. And I'm in my fifth season of having a vertical system. And hands down, it's the easiest way to grow plants. I say this with a full understanding that everything else that I have growing in my garden requires nearly daily maintenance or at least daily attention. 
The only thing that doesn't require work is my live wall. And that's because it does hook up to a hose, it's on a timer so it self irrigates, and I'm able to change it out seasonally really easily. So what I have is a live screen on wheels. It's great because you can move it wherever you want. I have mine sitting in my driveway so it acts as a screen from my side door so that I don't look out from my kitchen and see my car. And when I purchased this, it actually was delivered fully planted. One side was coleus, the other side was all food crops. Now each season we change it out. I'll be doing this usually around Halloween. And through the cool season, I love to grow things like broccoli and cauliflower, cabbage, lettuce. I even do grains across the top because they look really neat. And I add a few flowering things like uh, pansies and uh, snapdragons as well. What's really neat is that this is really a kid-friendly approach to gardening. So especially with kids being home more now, getting them outside to really experience the joys of growing and to understand where their food comes from is super valuable. And these vertical systems just totally open their world. And now when Abby walks around, she looks at the potential that every building offers as a result of this experience. And here you can see this is what it looks like mid-fall planted with cool season crops. And it's just super nice to be able to walk out that door, harvest what I need, put it on the table to eat. All right, so what should you grow? Let's start with flowers. Because the beautiful things that we grow through the summer are not going to be the plants that perform through the cool season. Not only because of temperature, but because day length. So many of these plants are going to bloom because they're triggered with shorter days. So the altogether classic plant, everyone has them, little basketballs of chrysanthemums. They're not my favorite plant in the world. However, my first internship, I grew 10 million of these. They all got shipped to Walmart. It was a really great experience for me to have had and I have a deep appreciation for these and I don't understand how they can be sold for $4.99. The nice thing with chrysanthemums is that they're really well suited for containers. Um, tomorrow I'm going to share information on chrysanthemums that are better planted in the ground. And there's definitely a difference between container mums and garden mums. Snapdragons. As a child I was obsessed with snapdragons. As an adult I remain completely obsessed. And you can basically get a snapdragon in any color that you want. Not only beautiful different color flowers, but they come in a whole bunch of different uh, foliage varieties. So you can get variegated or burgundy leafed. So there's just so many different cool options to be able to grow. And my favorite cool season flower are the violas and pansies. And first to talk about pansies. Pansies are the larger flower that you'll often find at garden centers starting right now. And these are really wonderful for the fall. However, they don't always have the best cold hardiness. So if you're trying to plant things for the fall that are gonna last all the way through winter into spring, what you wanna look for are the violas or the Johnny Jump Ups. And they come in a whole rainbow of colors and they are just so reliable. Uh, these are usually tested to negative 15 degrees before they melt down to the ground. So these have the cold hardiness that everybody is dreaming of. And the neat thing is they're edible. You can actually eat these flowers and Abby is completely obsessed with making salads and decorating them with all the different colors of violet all the different colors of violas. Now, what about grains? Because I've already told you I'm the crazy grain lady. Cool season is a fabulous opportunity. And I know that grains might seem a little unusual, so I wanna encourage you to start by growing them in pots so that they seem less intimidating because grains are really simple and basically they're just a cool season grass element. So you want to focus on growing these that will be able to go like basically in the middle of your pot, just like, you know, a fountain grass would through the summer season. So my, my top picks for uh, cool season grains include barley, oats, and wheat. You can also add rye. However, rye will often grow a little out of scale for a container. 
Now, I did a project last spring uh, at, at a couple of different breweries, and it made a lot of sense that breweries would have barley planted in their half barrels so that as people were enjoying their craft beer, they could actually understand what some of the botanical elements are that make that beer. And why not try and grow some of your own beer yourself, whether you harvest it or not? Now here um, is another type of grow bag, and this is actually wheat growing in this root maker pot. And I did this as an experiment because I wanted to see how much flour you would get, or right? basically how many loaves of bread can you get from four three gallon root maker pots. And the answer, we got four pounds of flour. That's actually a significant amount of flour. You can make a lot of bread from that. So I have everything that you need to be able to grow like a crazy green lady in the book. I have a seed line and then of course with the amazing power of soil cube. So what you do to grow grains in a container is just fill your pot with soil cube, scatter the green seed on top, mulch lightly, water it in. The grains will germinate typically within seven days. So you're not even having to wait very long. And you can see from day one to day seven what the grains start to look like. All right, now what about the cool season vegetables? Because there's actually a whole lot that you can choose from. I've narrowed it down to a few of my favorites for containers. Tomorrow we're going to talk about landscape. So broccoli, obviously I've shared my broccoli success story. I'll never not grow broccoli, especially in these hundred gallon root maker uh, root pouches. I also love to grow cabbage. Uh, cabbage is one of my favorite vegetables to eat, so I can never have too much. And I love to grow all the different varieties of culinary herbs, specifically in containers through the cool season, because my ground is just always too wet. Leafy greens, especially things like arugula, lettuce, kale, and mustard are fabulous additions to containers because they add texture and color and harvestability. And then here's an example of carrots, lettuce, and kale combined together in a pot. And for many people living in the South where we either have root knot nematodes or you have hard packed clay, growing something like a root vegetable like carrots in a container is really the best way that you're going to ensure that you'll actually get a carrot to harvest. I love kale, but prism is the variety that I highly recommend. This has great heat and cold tolerance, and it has lots of little ripples, so when you add salad dressing, it tastes even better. And of course, dinosaur kale, which I think Americans might be the only ones that call it that. Uh, Lacinato or Tuscan kale, this is a really beautiful, reliable, cold tolerant variety. So this is great to be planted now and it should get you all the way through the winter well into spring. Now lettuce, mustard, and Swiss chard, these are plants that a lot of times people just grow because they're pretty and that's fine because I want you to grow what brings you joy whether you eat it or not. And there's really nothing more dynamic than Swiss chard in a container with light shining through so that you can see that beautiful stained glass pattern. And here you can see some of my favorite varieties of Swiss chard include bright lights and canary yellow, both because they're so dynamic and I often bring these in and use them uh, for cut flower arrangements through the cool season. Okay, so now I'm gonna move into another container demo. And I'm so excited to be able to show you this and I've made a video on it as well. I'm just gonna transition my, my salad basket. Because I was so excited for this YouTube experience, last week I got started on making these demos so that I would have something to show, a before and after. So what I've done is I went to Home Depot, they didn't have any cool season vegetables ready yet, so I found a mum. That was basically all they had. And I thought, well, okay, I have Swiss chard that I've started growing for myself. I can do a mum. Swiss chard and wheat container that's going to be super unique and dynamic and I know that none of my neighbors are going to have it. 
So basically, I just have two matching plastic pots. These fit perfectly adjacent to my front door. And I filled it with soil cube. So now I'm just going to get the Swiss chard planted on either corner. I'm going to put the chrysanthemum in the middle towards the front. And I'm going to direct seed the, um, the wheat. And you know, sometimes people make fun of me for wearing dresses, but my dresses have pockets. They're very practical. So I'm going to start by doing the wheat. And basically, I'm just going to make a line across the back. And I am going to scatter one Crazy Grain Lady seed packet. And this is just soft white wheat. You can um, make bread from this wheat. One packet is the perfect amount so that you're going to have a really dense, grassy backdrop. Then you're just going to cover that seed up with your soil cube. I'm going to go ahead and add an additional top dress to make sure that that seed has good contact with the soil. That is like one of the most important things when you're growing from seed. And now you can see these are, these are Swiss chard that were direct seeded into these containers with soil cube. I mean it when I say that soil cube is the only thing I grow in. Look at those beautiful roots. These were seeded three weeks ago give you a reference. I'm going to dig a small hole, put that towards the corner, and do the same with this one. This, by the way, is the Bright Lights variety of Swiss chard, so you get a bunch of different colors of that petiole, which is the, the stem. And now I'm going to make room for that mum, which is going to give me kind of the instant gratification element of this container. Pop that into the center, add just a little bit more soil cube to make sure that everything is even and that all the seed is covered. That'll get watered in and literally within one week it will look like this pot. And you can see how beautiful this wheat is and right now the wheat is still short but as it starts to grow I'll just turn the pot around and that will be the backdrop for the chrysanthemum. So easy anyone can do it. I highly recommend that you get your children outside and have them start making some foodscape containers so that you can all enjoy the experience. So I want to thank you all so much for tuning in in this whole new world of the way that we get gardening education out to people. I look forward to answering your questions and I hope that y'all will keep in touch with me. Uh, you can visit my website, breegrows.com, and you can visit my uh, YouTube channel, Bree the Plant Lady, where I try to share simple, practical advice on how to grow all of your favorite plants. So thanks again so much for tuning in. We have a few questions. Will you tell us what gram positive means for BT? <laughs> I don't know if I know. <laughs> I should know that. Gram positive. I I don't know. Okay. That's we'll totally lame. That okay. Yeah. I you know I copied it off of the bag, y'all. Uh, what I assume it means, and this is probably totally not right. Um, I. I don't, I, I, yeah. Does it, do, does it mean that they, because they eat it? Is it a gram? I don't know. We'll I, find out. We'll answer that. Okay. The next question is, is where do you get your seeds? Oh my gosh. I'm addicted to seeds and I have a few favorite sources, including So True Seed, Southern Exposure Seed Exchange, and Baker Creek Heirloom Seed. For grains, I go to HancockSeed.com, but basically... Google is your tool. So if you have a particular plant that you're wanting to grow, usually what I start with is just putting that into the Google search and see who has what. You know, one of the great but sort of disruptive things about this era is that everybody is getting into gardening and seed supplies have been short. So you may have to think outside of the box, get to know people in your community, and certainly access your extension agents. Thank you, Bree. You're welcome. Thank you. Well, I certainly learned a lot. I always learn a lot from Bree, and I have some ideas that I'm going to go and start gardening and do this month. Um, we're going to have a five-minute break. After that, Chris Smith will come on and talk about all about growing garlic.
Well, that was a quick five minutes, and we're back with Chris Smith to tell us all about gardening. Please note there is a comment section below. The speakers would love to hear your feedback, anything you might have learned today that you're excited about gardening and doing this week or this, this coming fall, any questions you might have. We miss the live audience feel, so having those comments and that interaction from you would be a lot of fun for us. And so, Chris, take it away. Thank you. Hey all, very happy to be here speaking about garlic today. Uh, just for a quick overview of this presentation, my aim is to leave you guys in a position where you feel entirely confident to go out and buy some seed garlic, get it in the ground, grow it throughout the whole season, harvest it, store it, and eat it. So this is everything about growing garlic from a, a pretty beginner perspective, although maybe uh, some more experienced garlic growers could learn something as well. So really just to to get you established and make you feel confident because it's it's my personal belief that every shop, everybody should be growing garlic. It's, it's so easy to grow and so satisfying and so extensively used in the kitchen that it's one of those components of your own little micro food system that you can easily take on. So I'm gonna grab this. Okay, so yeah, my name is Chris Smith. Uh, just a quick bit about me. I run a nonprofit in Western North Carolina, just outside of Asheville, called the Utopian Sea Project. We take on a whole bunch of different crop trials and variety trials, and we're very much interested in 
uh, both the growing side and the eating side, so we do culinary evaluations. And actually right now I'm sourcing a whole bunch of different garlic for a large garlic variety trial that will be running this fall through winter to be harvesting and eating next year. So you should definitely stay in touch with that because we'll be learning more stuff as we go through those trials. And then for the last seven years I've been organizing the WNC, the Western North Carolina Garlic Fest. Sadly, this year we had to cancel it for fairly obvious reasons. It usually takes place right at the beginning of October and it's a real celebration of garlic. You mainly focus around eating it and lots of very interesting ways of eating it that we'll get to a little later in the presentation, but it's, it's just exciting to meet and interact with so many fellow garlic fanatics. And it's quite surprising how many people are out there that get really, really, really crazy when you uh, invite them just to <laughs> come and have an opportunity to taste and learn and eat and interact with other garlic people. So sadly canceled this year. One of the reasons I was so excited to give this presentation to you all is it kind of feels like I'm getting a little bit of my garlic itch scratched. Uh, and then this is our t-shirt from 2018. We had a t-shirt last year. I love this badge if you can see it on that screen. Crushed garlic and the patriarchy. Uh, I think as people that grow food then we have like a real power to take something into our hands that has other been, otherwise been taken away from us. So a big part of what I do with the Utopian Sea Project and my personal philosophy is that it's entirely empowering to grow food. And the more we can do that sustainably from year to year, the better. So we're really gonna do the whole cycle of garlic so that you're gonna learn how to maybe buy some seed garlic in the first year, but after that, you should just be up and running and able to really fulfill all your garlic needs going forward. So, I worked at So True Seed, a small seed company in Asheville, North Carolina for about six years. And one of the things we, we did as well as supplying seeds and seed garlic was we, we got a lot of questions. So this next short section kind of addresses some of the common questions that we came across all the time when people, certainly beginner gardeners, were getting interested in and, and wanted to grow garlic but weren't quite sure what to do. So we're gonna go through that section and then we'll get into the actual practicalities of planting and growing it. So um, first thing to recognize is there's a whole bunch of different varieties when it comes to garlic. And the number is, is a little bit unclear because some people will say there's hundreds if not thousands of varieties, which is pretty exciting. But then some of the science on the back end of that says, well actually a lot of those things are genetically identical varieties, but they've been grown in different areas and kind of developed their own expressions in those areas. So there's not been a massive genetic analysis of all the varieties to say, well, variety one, two, and three is actually the same. But, you know, science aside, if you start looking online and in seed catalogs and in local uh, nurseries around about this time, people are starting to sell it, at least for pre-order, if not for planting, then you'll come across a whole bunch of options. And I know as a beginner gardener, those options can be overwhelming. So. Let's just try and navigate some of the, the questions might, that might come up. The, the very first one that will come up, uh, at least if you start looking for them, but if you start talking to garlic people, is do you want to grow a hard neck garlic or do you want to grow a soft neck garlic? That's the first way that they take all those different garlic varieties and split them into two largely different groups, soft neck and hard neck. So what's that really mean? The, the main difference that we see in the garden when we're growing these two varieties is that one of them doesn't really have a neck, it's a soft neck, and one of them has a hard neck. And when we talk about that neck, we're really talking about the, the flower stalk that will grow out. And we'll come to that when we get into planting, but the hard necks will grow this flower stalk and the soft necks will not grow a flower stalk. And what that really means is the hard necks give us this very exciting, very delicious additional harvest that you don't get with the soft necks. So if you're growing a hard neck garlic, you're gonna get this scape that comes out. And you may have seen these, actually some supermarkets, you occasionally see these in the spring. You certainly see them cropping up in farmer's markets once you get to late spring, early summer. But this, this additional garlic harvest is really quite wonderful for the garlic grower. It's kind of got a mild garlicky taste. It, can be used exactly as you would use any type of garlic. So you can slice it and stir fry it, you can pickle it, you can ferment it, 
you can throw it into an early spring pesto. So all sorts of really delicious things you can do with escape. They actually store for quite a long time in the refrigerator. You can kind of think like a, a garlicky scallion with a little bit more density to it. So the scapes are, if we're talking about plus sides for soft neck versus hard neck, the scapes are a huge plus side in my opinion for growing hard neck garlic types. Sadly, it's not that clear because uh, there are some benefits for the soft neck too. So this is another picture just to show you the cross section because once we get into the actual bulb that we're going to grow of the garlic, again we've got the hard neck on the left and we've got the soft neck on the right. And one thing you may notice from that picture, and this is a common trait amongst the hard necks, is that there's just one ring of cloves in that bulb and they're quite large cloves. So generally with hard neck garlics we get these larger cloves and less of them per bulb. And then with the soft neck, we often get these multiple rings. Sometimes, depending on the variety, you can have three or even four rings. Now they get quite small as you go towards those outer rings, but you're certainly talking about multiple levels. So you, in general, get way more cloves per bulb, even though those cloves tend to be a little bit smaller. So that's a key difference. And something that you're not gonna get to quite see on that picture, but I, I might be able to demonstrate to you is this is a hard neck in my left hand and it's got a central stalk and it's very stiff <laughs> that's the outer paper it's very stiff on that central stalk so that was the the scape the flower stalk that came up and out and, and grew the scape it exists all the way down to the root so if I were to break this open and separate out some of these cloves what we see is that we've got these big cloves and we've got this stalk up the center. So that's classic, you know, a key trait of the hard neck garlics. So that's on that side. The soft neck just doesn't have that. It kind of comes to this point. And actually most supermarket garlics, if not all supermarket garlics, uh, are likely to be soft neck garlics. We'll learn why in just one second, but it, what that means is you've probably interacted with soft necks uh, if you've been buying garlic from the supermarket in a way that you haven't interacted with a hard neck. So you see we don't have any central column in the soft neck and uh, I don't know if you can hear this but the the soft neck is really papery and crispy whereas the hard neck garlic kind of broke apart much more cleanly so it didn't have all that paper fluff around it. And so what that means when we get these varieties into the kitchen is the hard necks are actually really awesome to work with in the kitchen because the skin is way less papery once you get down to that clove level and it almost cracks right off. It, it comes off really, really easily. And so you end up being able to break out a clove just by taking off whole solid chunks of skin. So if you're processing a whole bunch of garlic and certainly chefs enjoy this a lot, it, it makes it really easy to work with in the kitchen. This papery soft neck one is, is already more messy and once you get down to the clove level that messiness continues and if you process a lot of soft neck garlic what you find is that this paper sticks to your juicy garlic fingers and gets everywhere and it's just way more annoying to peel a whole bunch of soft neck garlics versus hard neck garlics. So put that in your pro con calendar as well. So the next pro for, let me jump forward. Uh, this is when we can start putting them all into one place so you can go back and reference it. But the, the other pro that people put out there for the hard neck, and I'm not 100% I'm not convinced about this, uh, certainly as a beginner gardener, but you'll generally hear people saying that hard neck garlics have a more authentic garlic flavor. Like they contain spicier, more complex tones and while hard neck garlics are absolutely delicious, I also think there's a whole bunch of really good soft neck varieties out there. And maybe when we're really getting down to a fine wine level and we're comparing homegrown hard necks to homegrown soft necks, you might find that those spicier hard necks have a certain application in one direction versus the soft necks. But if we're comparing both homegrown soft necks and homegrown hard necks to a supermarket bought garlic, 
then you know it, it, there's no comparison. So don't be put off from growing soft necks because somebody's told you that hard necks taste better. Your your homegrown soft neck garlic is gonna beat anything you've ever tasted if you've not tried homegrown or local farmer grown garlics. Uh, but you know, put, put put that in your pipe and smoke it. So from that point forward. You may be wondering, well, why, why would I grow soft necks? Because you've just given me a whole bunch of like tasty, scape, easy to peel, wonderful in the kitchen, reasons to really love the hard neck varieties. The reason we might flip towards the soft necks are, are, are two. One, we, well, me in Asheville, Western North Carolina, I'm on this like perfect border where I can really easily grow hard necks and really easily grow soft necks. But people that are way further north tend to gravitate towards hardnecks because they tend to be uh, better able to cope with really cold conditions. And people that are way further south tend to gravitate towards softnecks because they don't need overwinter cold conditions to grow well. So softnecks if you're in a warmer climate, hardnecks in a colder climate, there's this pretty wide boundary that includes North Carolina where you can definitely grow both and it depends on the winter, right? We've seen extreme weather events as climate change ramps up. And so last winter was really mild. This winter they're predicting it's gonna be really cold. So again, keep that in your mind, but don't be too swayed for it unless you're really far north or really far south and then you may wanna to commit to one or the other. I think generally we can do either or. But the one that might really convince you to go ahead and plant some soft necks is that they almost always store for a much longer period of time. And that comes back to the construction of that paperiness of that bulb. What we see with the soft necks is that this paper is really tight to the bulb, it makes it hard to peel in the kitchen, but actually really helps conserve moisture and means that it stores for a long, long time. So that real tight paperiness is what we want for a long storing garlic. And that's the main reason why these garlics end up in the supermarkets, because they store for a long time. Nobody wants to invest in produce that's not gonna last for very long. Uh, and the soft necks combat that really well. You can get storage of up to a year if stored really well with certain varieties. Whereas the, so the hard necks, with that crispy, easy to peel off, they just don't trap the moisture as well. And so we end up in a position where we're maybe looking at three to six months, if you're lucky, with hard neck storage. So if you want to grow garlic that you're going to eat all year till your next garlic harvest, if you're just relying on hard necks, you're unlikely to get fresh garlic after, you know, well, into the next year at all. Uh, whereas the soft necks will get you all the way through to the next harvest. So. That leaves us in a position where there's no easy answer where I'm going to say you should definitely do this, but hopefully it gives you a rounded information to look at those catalogs with a little bit more detail and make a good decision from there. I will say that most seed companies will offer some kind of variety selection pack that will almost always give you a little bit of hard neck and a little bit of soft neck. And if you're a first time garlic grower and you're really not sure where to go with this, just go ahead and get the sampler. It's usually a reliable, good selection of varieties that are probably gonna do well for you and will give you the opportunity to sample a few different things. And then maybe next year you'll, you know, you'll fall in love with one particular variety and go ahead next year, buy three pounds of it and do your whole garden in that one variety. But starting off, you know, keep your options open and, and I wouldn't worry too much in either direction or the other. Oh, let me just mention this one down at the below. Easier to braid is commonly cited as being on the soft neck, soft neck plus list and that's just because that solid stalk gets very brittle so if you leave it on it's going to be hard to turn into a braid. Many people will say that you cannot braid hard neck garlics, but a, a good friend of mine who grows a lot of garlic, Jana Fishman, she also does basket weaving from tree bark. And she's like, if you can weave baskets from tree bark, you can braid hard neck garlic. And, and that really changed my thinking on that. And basically you just have to do a little bit more like softening of the neck to be able to braid it and maybe have a slightly different braiding pattern. So don't, don't believe it if people say you cannot braid hard neck garlics, just know that it's easier to braid the soft necks. Okay, so I, I've got this in as a kind of a reference slide. I don't really think it's that important for first-time garlic growers, but it is interest, interesting to know that 
while we go from all the garlic into two camps of hard neck and soft neck, we can further sub subcategorize it from there and have quite distinctive type traits within each of them. And then from there, you break it down into varieties and you may end up selecting your perfect variety. But it's, it does get more nuanced than just those two camps of hard neck and soft neck. So when you're going online and you're seeing the variety description and it's saying it's a hard neck, you may also see some of these terms. And so I just wanted you to be aware that they exist as an additional level of category for when you're selecting garlic. One of my uh, favorite books, it's just it's kind of a classic is growing great garlic. And it's based on a guy that grows uh, Northwest America, but he has a farm called Fillery Farms, and, and they're still in business today. You can still go to their website and buy garlic from these guys. And so they've got this wealth of historical information on growing all these different garlics. Now, when he wrote this book, he was categorizing things just into hard neck and soft neck, and this subcategory level kind of developed after that point. So this is from the 80s, this book. It's, it's, it's a good book, but just know its limitations is that it doesn't involve this information. But you can take this book and go to their website, and now they have fantastic information on all these subcategories, and all their garlics are put into one group or the other. And so what, what it means, really, is we can know that hardnecks have slightly less cloves per bulb, but once we go into a deeper level, like porcelain, type garlics have like really, really few, maybe four or five per bulb. And then when we come down here, we know that the silver skins within the subset of the soft neck category store for the absolute longest. And actually, I wanted to show you this one variety that I've just begun working with. This was given to me last year by uh, Jeff McCormack, who used to own and run Southern Exposure Seed Exchange. And he's been working with this garlic it's really, really small bulbs, so you might look at this and go, you're a terrible garlic grower. But um, <laughs> he, he gave it me this and said, this garlic will store for two years. So a two-year storing garlic is pretty awesome if you want to have your own micro-sustainable food system and be eating your own garlic all year round. The reason it's so small, we'll get into this a little bit when we're, we're planting. He, he sent it to me in December, which is really late to plant garlic, and he sent me tiny, tiny little cloves. So if you're starting late with small cloves, then it can take a year or two to build up to a clove size that will get you a decent-sized bulb. So um, don't worry about the size of it. It's the genetic traits in there that allow it to store for so long that I'm really excited and interested in. And then we couldn't really talk about growing garlic without mentioning elephant garlic. The, the fun thing with elephant garlic is it's not really a garlic. It's a related species. So tomorrow we're going to speak about all sorts of different uh, oniony, garlicky type things we can plant in the fall that have fairly similar growing conditions to garlic. So if you know how to grow garlic well, you can often grow these other things really well. So that's tomorrow's presentation. But I definitely wanted to slip elephant garlic in just because it's got garlic in its, its name. It's actually way more closely related to leeks. So think of it as a bulbing leek. What you're seeing here is a clove, and this isn't a miniature clove, this is a normal sized clove of a hard neck garlic, uh, which tend to be fairly large cloves. And then that's a clove of an elephant garlic. So you can see the size comparison is quite uh, magnificent when it comes to the elephant garlics. They're really fun to grow as a, as a plant in the landscape. They're a dramatic plant. They've got beautiful foliage, a, a little more like leeks. You see, it, you see the similarity when you're growing them, uh, kind of darker blue-green leaves. This is, this is a young plant here, but you can see the, the leek-like uh, relationship there. So one, it's fun to grow something that's so huge, like putting this on a dinner plate and giving it to a guest is just really fun because they're like, what, what, what on earth is that? Uh, they have a much milder flavor. So if you're not really into those intense garlic flavors, you can actually get a really nice, you can roast these cloves whole and then smash them and they kind of caramelize a little bit and they're not too overwhelming. And you can just use it as a paste on toast with a little bit of salt and herbs and kind of have this instant garlic bread from elephant garlic. So just the quantity is impressive. And then people use these as landscaping plants as well because buying ornamental full planted alliums will give you some beautiful uh, foliage, but the elephant garlic will give you similar flowers. So you get these bulbous like 
flower heads that are really just quite stunning. These are edible, so you can kind of take them and sprinkle them on a salad or into scrambled eggs or with some mushrooms or something like that. So it's kind of an ad additional harvest if you want to let it go to flower. It holds up really well as a cut flower, so if you want a, uh, a cut flower in the spring, then that's another option. So if you're feeling a bit experimental or you want to try something different, then the elephant garlic is definitely there as an option, and we'll cover it a little bit more tomorrow as well. So. You've made your decision about which varieties to get. Uh, you're probably going to get really excited and buy lots of different varieties. But how much garlic do you need? And this is the second big question we need to tackle. And it, again, it's not an easy question because we've already established that a soft neck bulb has way more cloves than a hard neck bulb. And when it comes to planting garlic, we plant one single clove to get a whole bulb. So it's pretty easy math to work out how much we need to plant because you just get all those cloves. But knowing how many cloves you get from what you're purchasing is where it gets a bit more tricky. So this chart kind of gives you a, a general idea. We've got some hard necks here, some soft necks, and then you can see the different sizes because people generally don't send, sell you 10 cloves of garlic. That's not the way you're gonna see it when you go to the catalogs and the websites. They're gonna sell it by the pound usually. Occasionally you'll find it by the bulb. Certainly if you go to farmer's markets to buy garlic, you'll buy it by the bulb. But online, most seed companies are gonna sell it by weight. And so it becomes quickly less meaningful to say, uh, I've got this bed that I wanna plant. Uh, do I need half a pound, 10 pounds? Like it's, it's hard, to, hard to know. So just be aware of that when you go and do your garlic shopping. And most good companies, like reliable sources, are gonna go ahead and give you an, an average of how many cloves there are per pound. And it's that figure that you really need to pay attention to and just know that it's gonna change, it's definitely gonna change from soft neck to hard neck, but it's also gonna change a little bit from variety to variety. So. Keep that in the back of your head when you're shopping because you're gonna go at it knowing you need a certain amount of cloves to grow a certain amount of bulbs and that information is out there if you search for it. So I put some of that into a chart so you can go back and reference it. These are all averages, so there's gonna be varieties that are gonna be you know, exceptions to these uh, generalizations. Across them all, you're gonna get an average of four to seven bulbs per pound. And that's because normally, when they sell seed garlic, they're selecting a, an average size bulb, even though within that bulb, we know we get different quantities of cloves. So then that breaks down into the, the differences once you get into hard neck and soft neck. And you can see it's per bulb if you're buying it at farmer's market, so you've got a rough idea going into it, or per pound if you're buying it online. So you can plan from there. And then I've given you these numbers as well. Again, that's kind of garlic 201. We're going to that next level where we're wanting to go through for specific garlic types. And you can see where we get into the nuanced information. So there's nuanced growing habits, nuanced amount of cloves per bulb and that type of thing. So the information's there, just pay attention to it when you're purchasing your garlic. Okay, so um, let me just jump back one step because I, I wanted to do a, a quick little bit of garlic math because one thing we find when we're speaking to people about growing garlic is we usually end up in this realm of the garlic festival where we're dealing with all these garlic fanatics. And so if you ask them, so, well, how much garlic do I need? And you say, well, how much garlic do you eat? And they're like, oh, I eat like a bulb a day. And so that suddenly becomes a lot of garlic because that means you've got to plant 365 cloves of garlic to grow 365 bulbs of garlic so that when you harvest, you've got a bulb every single day to eat. So sometimes it's not realistic to go from that angle, If certainly if we're small home gardeners, we need to think about how much space we have. So you can do the garlic math in either direction. If you've got infinite amounts of space and you're totally lunatic about garlic, then go ahead and, and work backwards from how much garlic you need to harvest to be able to eat. I would say definitely, add on like a 10 to 20% rule. So if you know you wanna plant 365 cloves, then I would bump that up to, you know, 400, 425, because, you know, Brie talked about some of the, the issues we have in the garden. Things are gonna eat your garlic. Maybe some of it won't grow, some of it might rot. You know, it's gardening, it's real life. It's unlikely you're gonna have 100% success. So I always add that buffer on. And then also pay attention to the fact 
that when you're growing garlic, the thing that you plant is the clove, and the thing that you eat is the clove. So if you want to enter into this kind of sustainable cycle, then you need to not only be growing enough garlic for you to eat the whole year, but you also need to have enough surplus so that you can hold some back for planting uh, in that cycle as well. So it's, it's easy enough to kind of sit down with a pencil and paper and plant it out like you do with your seeds and your other gardening stuff, um, but just b build that extra component in if you want to be able to have enough to plant as well. The reverse side of that is to say, you know, I've only got a four foot by eight foot bed to commit to this garlic, and then you can work out how much space you have to plant and go from there. And we're gonna get into planting and spacing once we get into the growing section, so you'll have that information pretty soon. Okay, so the last, the last big question that I'm gonna uh, cover before getting into the uh, nitty gritty details of all of this is, what is certified seed garlic? It's, you're gonna see it when you go to these websites and it's really important to appreciate what it is. So certified seed garlic is garlic that is being grown under some level of regulatory conditions to ensure that it's gone through proper field conditions, proper testing to make sure that you're not gonna get any of the common garlic diseases in that garlic. So when we think about planting our garden, most of the time we're thinking about seeds when it comes to vegetables. And seeds are wonderful because they propagate through sexual propagation. We've got flowers, we've got pollen, and it all gets mixed up, and we have this quite robust way of generating new seeds. So they're quite good at growing year on year on year because they're always new. But when we're growing things like sweet potatoes, potatoes like Irish potatoes, and garlic, then what we're actually doing is taking part of the plant and replanting it to grow. That's called clonal propagation. We're literally cloning the mother plant and making an identical replica. And that makes life really easy because you don't have to worry about seed saving and pollination or anything like that. But it also has some drawbacks. When we do that for multiple generations, then we're not having any adaptation within those genetics. And we find that these clonally reproduced crops year on year on year become more susceptible to certain plants and diseases. So that's something just to be aware of, not scared of, but aware of when it comes to sourcing and growing garlic. And that's where this certified seed garlic comes in. If you're buying certified seed garlic, it's definitely gonna be more expensive than walking into the supermarket, but what you're buying is the reassurance that this isn't gonna come with a little package of some fungal disease that's gonna get in your soil and be there for multiple years where you can't grow any other oniony, garlicky type crop again. So it's, it, it's worth the investment. Now once you've planted it that first year, you can have your own selection criteria and you can look at the cloves and make sure they're disease free and only plant the healthiest ones. And we'll get into that a bit more deeply so you can just have this one time investment. But you, if you go into the supermarket and buy that garlic, you just don't know the conditions that it's been grown, you don't know where it's come from, and it may look totally healthy and be something good to eat, but it, it may be bringing in something you don't want into your garden. The other problem with going in and buying supermarket garlic is one, a huge amount of our garlic available in America is imported from China, and we uh, don't necessarily know the growing conditions of that, that garlic. And what they often do, because they're shipping it so far, is spray the garlic with a growth inhibitor, and that's gonna prevent the garlic from sprouting. And I know there's a lot of people out there who'll be like, but I put my store-bought garlic on the, on the shelf and it's sprouted just fine. Even if it then sprouts, it's probably gonna be a delayed sprouting, and then once it does sprout, it's probably gonna have slightly less vigor than a, a true seed garlic that has been grown with the intention of being planted to grow more garlic. So I, I strongly recommend you go that route. Second best to that, if you're, if you're just gonna buy some culinary garlic, buy it from a farmer's market. You're supporting someone local, you'll know that that garlic has been grown in this region, and you're able to have a conversation with your farmer just to make sure that that they're unlikely to be spraying growth inhibitors, but just to make sure that they, uh, you can ask them, are, are they rotating their garlic in their field and, and simple things like that. Have you, have you had any disease issues? If, if you speak to them, garlic so, um, farmers are people too. And if you say, look, I'm gonna plant this garlic and I wanna make sure that it's, it's gonna be good in my garden, they'll probably tell you if, if they've had some disease issues in the past and, and warn you against doing that. So 
that's that's the whole certified sea garlic thing and, and definitely worth your time okay so growing great garlic let's let's jump straight into this so that you can uh, walk away from this presentation raring to go in your garden i will say that one of the one of the wonderful things about growing garlic is that it's it's like this last fling of the season because usually when we talk about fall planting and, and Brie covered this, it's, you know, it's, it's happening now. Some of the stuff that needed to be seeded was, was a while back. Some of it you can buy as transplants, but in my opinion, I've still, got, I've still got tomatoes, I've still got squash, I've still got okra. My garden is still in summer mode and I'm overwhelmed with that harvest, enjoyed and overwhelmed with that harvest. And I'm just trying to stay on top of weeding and, and all that sort of stuff. So often with first time or beginner gardeners, when we start talking about full gardening, it's just like goes right over their head because they're like, how do you expect me to deal with all these things that are currently in the garden as well as planning and starting a fall garden. But garlic is awesome because you plant it way, way after your summer garden is all done and dusted. So when we think about planting garlic, it's, it's a true fall planted garlic. So we don't eat it until the following year. We've got this whole nine month cycle to go from planting to harvest and eating and then we can store it for a long time after that so it's it's very different in that respect from a lot of our annual vegetables where we were planting the seed or the transplant and expecting to get a harvest within you know a couple of months maybe for longer things like winter squash maybe it's three months four months even is not crazy but nine months in the ground is a long time but a lot of that time is over the coldest winter months when not a lot else is growing too productively and so we're kind of using that garden for a part of our season that would otherwise be dormant or in cover crop or in containers that we're able to protect. So it's nice, it's nice to use that season and it's nice to be planting something after the craziness of summer has, plant, uh, has finished. So I think garlic is one of the best like next steps. If you've just planted a garden for the first time this year, garlic is you know, something you can do late on in the season. So we're going to go through through these just so you got a good handle on each of the steps uh, and, and cover some key points for planting garlic. Fall planting. When I say fall, it's this is going to change based on where you are, and you know we're, we're on the internet, so you could be anywhere. But um, I'm in Western North Carolina, and I always think about October as being the perfect planting month. We have our garlic festival the first weekend of October. We get everyone jazzed about garlic. We sell seed garlic, and then people can plant it for that month. You can plant later into the season. I've planted all the way, successfully planted all the way through to Thanksgiving. I've relatively unsuccessfully planted into December. This is, this is a December planting, so you see it's okay for me because I'm just expanding this seed stock, but if you were relying on it as your year-round garlic harvest, then you'd be pretty disappointed is if this is what you pulled out. And that was a December planting. You can plant garlic as late as spring. Uh, you've just gotta be uh, acknowledging that you may not get as big a yield as you would if you planted earlier. So we, we generally go for that kind of October sweet window. Somewhere between Halloween and Thanksgiving should be fine. If you're further north, then you're gonna to have to go earlier. If you're further south, you may be able to go later. So that's, that's the general idea there. And then what do we need to do for bed prep? What's, what's going on here? It's just a picture of some soil, but it's actually really good soil. I, I've spent a lot of time working on my soil with, with cover crops and with manures. And actually this year I've started using the soil cube two as an amendment. And you want to have a really rich soil to plant this garlic into because while it's not a massively heavy feeder, it is in the ground for a long time. So if you can plant it into some uh, good quality uh, or amend with good quality compost, maybe some uh, well-rotted leaves, that, that kind of thing incorporated into your garden bed where you're gonna plant the garlic is really gonna help your garlic have the nutrients that it needs to get it through and growing strongly. So. Good quality soil, but nothing super, super special is, is what you're going for there. This is the Spanish garlic. So that's, that's this one planted, which means we know that picture was taken around about December. Okay, so we do that fall planting, and uh, once you've planted, you wanna mulch pretty heavily. And so I'm gonna draw you a diagram 
very briefly so that I can show you the planting system and the spacing so you got a good idea. Um, but pretty much you, you plant and you mulch straight on top. There are people that will not mulch. And if you're further south, you may get away with it. But where I am in Western North Carolina, one of the, one of the big reasons to mulch isn't that, that garlic isn't cold hardy enough to survive those freezing temperatures. It's that if we get consistent ground freeze and thaw, then we get this heaving of the garlic. So you've planted your garlic in the ground and it can kind of work its way out. And one thing we don't want is to have the garlic coming to the top before it starts growing properly. So the mulch kind of just gives that blanketed insulative layer, keeps the garlic in place, does protect against some of those real dramatic dips in cold temperature that could cause some damage, and also does weed suppression. So this nine month growing cycle, we've already said is a long, long time to have garlic in the ground. Garlic doesn't like to have heavy weed pressure. And so this mulch does this kind of like double purpose of insulation, preventing the weeds from growing up. And then as the season progresses, it's actually gonna decompose and add nutrients to the top of the soil as well. So I definitely, I have always mulched my garlic, even though I know there are some people that don't go for it because of the extra effort. And the, uh, the downside would be slower warming in the spring, but I've never had an issue with that. So let me show you a quick di diagram so that you've got a, a good handle when you get your garlic. Uh, we'll switch over here. So I've already broken up one of these cloves. And as I, as I am in this kind of October winter window and I've got my fall, uh, my fall seed stock has been shipped or I've gone into the store and bought it, then I'm gonna break apart my cloves like this. And you can see I've been fairly rough with my garlic. You should be relatively gentle. But that being said, that's the one I peeled. So I probably wouldn't plant that because I've broken the clove itself. So don't, that's my eating garlic. But this one where a little bit's just broken off, it's still gonna grow just fine. So you don't need to worry if you lose a little bit of skin. You also definitely don't need to peel the garlic for planting. It's fine to go in completely covered with its peel. And what we see, I think it's fairly intuitive, but we do get people that plant them upside down. Uh, you got the pointy end, which is the top, and then you got kind of like this rougher end which actually on a whole clove is already roots, okay? So pointy end up, root end down. Uh, and we're gonna plant that into the garden. In terms of depth, this, this is the world of gardening, right? So I, I'm gonna tell you what I do. And if you wanna go online and search it, then you're gonna see 30 other ways to go about it. One thing I learned early in gardening is that uh, you need to ditch your ego and while there's 30 different ways to do something, that doesn't mean that your way is better than my way or my way is better than your way. Because usually I found when I've done side-by-side -side trials of all these different methods, you get pretty much the same results. So don't get too stressed out about that. Um, what I do is I aim to have two inches of soil on top of my garlic. So I'm gonna dig about a three to four inch hole going down. I'm gonna put my garlic clove in and I'm gonna have about two inches of soil on top. And then I'm gonna put about four inches of mulch on top of that. So it's gonna be really well blanketed. If you don't mulch, then people tend to go a lot deeper. So just be aware of that. So that's my kind of clove prep and planting hole. There's this, uh, there's another way to do this that you, instead of just planting in a little hole, you can kind of just hoe out a whole trench. So I just take my hoe and go all the way down. And then I would just lay my garlic or you know, kind of press it into the soil so it's still pointy up in my trench. And then you can just backfill over the top of it. So if I'm doing long rows, then this can be a little bit more efficient. If I'm just doing a small raised bed or a container, I'm not gonna trench that. I'm just gonna dig a little hole in with a trowel. So that's your kind of option there um, for planting style. If you do plant your garlic upside down, it's still gonna grow like plants are magical. Um, but it's gonna literally grow down and then back up and when you harvest it You're gonna have this weird neck shape on it, and it's just it's not ideal Okay, so uh, let me draw a, a pretty standard raised bed This is a four foot by eight foot raised bed So this is what a lot of people have a lot of people like growing in raised beds with garlic because they tend to drain a little bit better and garlic doesn't ha like having wet feet 
Uh, so raised beds are good for that. They're easy to amend and all that sort of thing as well. It seems to be becoming more common practice to do raised beds. So if I'm going to do this, then again, spacing is going to change. What you need to know is as you get smaller and smaller spacing, you're going to get smaller and smaller bulbs. And if you go too big, then you're going to have more opportunity for weeds to come in and you're going to be not growing a lot of garlic for your given space. So there's this kind of like sweet spot that you're trying to find where you're, you're cramming as much garlic in as possible. So you're getting a lot of garlic, but you're not putting so much in that it's compromising the size of your bulbs. So what I've landed on in this type of bed is I would do three rows here. So that would give me 12 inch spacing between those rows. And also there's a, there's a definite edge effect. I guess it depends on how you built your raised beds, but I just raise up, I just mound my beds with soil. I don't actually have a hard boundary. So I get this compacted earth edge effect on my, on my raised beds. So I don't like to plant right to the edge because I know the soil is a little more compacted and that can also affect growth. So I've got three rows in there. And then within the row, I generally go for like six inch spacing. So I go all the way down six inch spacing. This is now not to scale unless I got really lucky. Um, but if you do the math then you get 15 cloves per row. So you get 45 cloves per bed and that's gonna produce 45 bulbs of garlic, which is actually a reasonable amount of garlic um, for a non garlic fanatic. So, um, this works pretty well with the 12 inch spacing because we don't find that one garlic outshades the other. And the in row spacing definitely can come down to like five or four inches without compromising it too much. But it also depends on the quality of your soil. If you've got like fantastic soil, that's really, really, really good and gonna provide all those nutrients, then you can get away with tighter spacing. If you've got slightly worse soil, then your garlic's gonna have to mine more widely for that, those nutrients. And if they're butting up against other garlic that's also mining for nutrients, then that competition is what's going to restrict the bulb development. So that's a classic one. Um, I know a lot of people that do eight by three beds uh, because they don't like leaning all the way into the middle. So a little bit narrower. With a little bit narrower, I wouldn't be tempted to squeeze in those three rows. So I'd probably just do two rows all the way down. But what I might do is push those rows a little bit to the edge. So maybe just like eight or 10 inches in from either edge, which gives me a center row to do some, uh, either a spring crop or a, uh, like a, a real early spring crop. So I might put like a real, like a winter radish would work there. So something that's gonna go in and come out pretty quickly. So before these guys start growing up really big, maybe I'll have a lettuce or a kale or a spinach that I'm just doing as a baby green. But there's definitely an opportunity there to grow something between your garlic rows without, you know, kind of companion planting style without compromising the growth of the garlic. And then the, uh, I'm not gonna talk too much about containers. You've got a really good idea of how to do containers from Brie. Um, so really all I need to add is spacing. Um, so if we had, I'm, Brie had lots of fancy parts. I have five gallon buckets. So think, think of that as a five gallon bucket. Um, so about 12 inches across is probably what we're looking at there. If we're gonna go with um, four inch spacing, then it's unlikely that we're gonna get much more, like we might get away with four bulbs in there. You might wanna go down to three. Um, it's gonna be pretty tight in there and I wouldn't expect the highest yields, but the foliage is really beautiful. So it can work as a landscaping crop, crop in a container. The other thing with containers I find that we tend to put much better soil into containers than we sometimes put into our gardens. So if this is a bucket full of soil cubed and you're adding some fertilizer later in the season, then you're gonna be supplying the nutrients that they want. And while the garlic is super cold hardy in these raised beds, once we get those buckets raised up out the ground, if that whole thing freezes through, then you could have some pretty serious damage. So you're gonna to wanna to either shelter it close to the house, cluster buckets together, or even blanket the bucket if you're gonna get some of those real low cold temperatures. So that's a few different planning instructions that kind of get you going. If, if you're more, if you've got more space and you're doing row culture, then you can still ap apply the same spacing. Obviously we just break out of it. We're doing a trial this year and we've got 25 foot rows. So we're gonna do three strips, 25 foot rows of each variety, uh, and it will look just like uh, this type of planting. 
So that's kind of uh, planting depth and spacing to get you going. Uh, not real rocket science there, but it gives you some ideas on how much you can actually grow in whatever space you have. Oh, I do want to mention uh, the, the last planting option, uh, and this is again one of Bree's favorites, is interplanting with other crops. So, you know, this is kind of classic. I'm going to have a block of this, a block of that. But you can go ahead and do border planting. Uh, I don't need the board anymore. Um, <laughs> you can go ahead and do uh, border planting with perennials and just kind of tuck them in wherever you want. The, the only thing you need to really be aware of with that is, is one, weed pressure, so it's still gonna have to deal with the weed. And the second one is garlic really does like full sun. So if you're not giving it full sun, you're gonna have reduced yields and you, know, you can balance whether it's worth it or not. Uh, Brie was telling me earlier that she, she does this to repel voles because they don't like the, the allium bulbs. So if your primary objective is just to repel bulbs, then you could do quite tight spacing anywhere you wanted and the garlic would do its job. And then whatever you harvest would be a bonus. If you really wanted a high yield, then you need to pay attention to the, the spacing and the sun requirements as you integrate it into your landscape. But garlic is a great one to tuck in to any bed that you have a little bit of space if you want to go that route. Okay. Where was I? Mulching. So we've mulched, um, which I've already said is really important. And so the concept here is to get our garlic in the ground and have it over winter. And while it's overwintering, it's going to be putting some root growth out. Because our primary objective with growing most alliums, but specifically garlic, is to be at a point when it starts warming up enough in the spring that the garlic is like ready to go because it's kind of a race against time that we want to get as much green growth on our plants as possible before we reach a certain length of day. Because as, as we get to a certain length of day, about 13 hours of daylight, then that's what triggers the garlic to go, oh, it's time for me to start forming bulbs. And once it starts forming bulbs, it kind of doesn't do much more green growth from that point forward and additional fertilizer and all that sort of stuff really isn't gonna help you that much. So you kind of got this window to get as much green growth as possible because the more green growth you have, the more energy you're gonna be able to put into larger bulb formation. If you have really piddly plants going into those 13 hour days, you're gonna have really piddly bulbs and there's nothing you can do about it. So we do this full planting to allow it to establish itself so it's raring to go when the time comes which is why my December planted garlic, it just didn't, by the time we got to spring it, it just hadn't had enough time to do much. So the plants never did much, so the bulbs never did much. Whereas this, um, this variety I've been growing for quite a few years now is called Chinese Pink. I love it because it's really, really early maturing and tastes good. It's a hard neck variety. This I, I had around and I planted at the right time, probably early November. And you can see I've got, I've got good sized bulbs and it was consistent for the whole population. And it was just the opposite. Lots of time to grow those roots and then we were able to shoot forward once spring happened. Now, does that mean that I can plant garlic now and have massive bulbs come next year? Sadly, the answer is no, because what's gonna most likely happen is you'll get a lot of root development, but you'll then start getting green development quite significantly before going into winter. And when those garlic shoots are really small, they're really tough and can deal with the super cold conditions. But when they get up big, a real hard freeze is gonna kill them back to the ground. If that happens, don't panic. The garlic's gonna come back, but um, it's kind of wasted some of that initial energy that the garlic's put into growing and it's gonna have to redo that work uh, next year. So a little bit of growth is good going into winter, not essential, so don't panic if you plant your garlic and don't get anything but too much growth and you uh, are at risk of losing the top growth to frost. So there's this sweet spot. October is my month. So what you should be seeing as it's one of the first things to green up in the garden. You, you come into spring and everything's kind of brown and dying and you're praying for some green, dreaming of tomatoes. This is the first thing that you're gonna see coming up uh, if you've done your job right. And at this stage, because our aim is to get as much green growth as possible, then some nitrogen fertilizer could really help speed it along. Now I'm kind of a lazy or distracted or stingy gardener, you can choose, but I, 
I'm, I rarely fertilize anything. I, I said at the beginning that I spend a lot of time working on my soil with, with cover crops, um, and uh, I do a lot of wood chip mulches in the paths that then end up on the, on the soil. So I, I do other things to make sure my soil health is good, but I, I often don't fertilize, and I generally don't fertilize my garlic and do okay. That being said, most people would recommend that a early spring nitrogen fertilizer is going to help your plants have that boost to get the green growth to get the bigger bulbs. Uh, that could be the fish emulsion that Bree talked about. That's a really, really good source of nitrogen um, and smells good. Uh, you can do that as a foliar spray if you want. So you can spray it on the leaves and the leaves will absorb the nutrients, which is pretty amazing. Uh, you can do it as a root drench and just kind of soak the root area so it gets a good nitrogen uptake there. You could side dress with things like blood meal um, or, you know, your nitrogen fertilizer of choice. But uh, that's definitely a, a pretty general recommendation to improve the growth of your plants, certainly if your soil isn't optimal. So we get these plants that are growing up here and this is, so now we're kind of in February, March, we're seeing this green growth and we're excited about our crop that's growing that we planted so long ago. We get into April and May and we start getting opportunities for our first harvest. So if you didn't grow enough garlic last year and you ran out of garlic in December and you've you know, been upset ever since, then this is your chance to get your first garlicky harvest. Um, the, the first one that comes up are these, this green garlic. I've started seeing this cropping up in farmer's markets, so it's kind of becoming a thing, but people that have grown their own garlic have known about it for a long time. It's kind of the scallion stage of garlic, or sometimes called garlic rounds. It's before the garlic has had a chance to segment into its separate cloves. So the garlic initially just grows around ball. If you harvest garlic in March, this is what you'll see. And then later it segments into its separate cloves that we know when we buy a, a head or a bulb of garlic. So this is really delicious. It's kind of like a, a true garlic experience, maybe a little bit milder, very, very tender. You can eat the whole green scallion and the bulb, and it's a pretty inspiring, wonderful part of growing garlic. My, what I do is once I get to about April-ish, then I'll start looking at my rows and some of my plants will be big and lush and going for it and some of them will just be piddly. Maybe, maybe I planted small cloves, maybe they've not had access to nutrients. So, some things happen that they're not taking off and I pretty much know from experience that they're not going to turn into a wonderful big bulb that I'm going to want to store as my garlic harvest. So those are the ones that I'll go in and it's kind of like a thinning procedure. I'll go in and I'll dig them out. Occasionally you'll see two shoots coming up out of the ground and that means you've planted You've planted a clove That looked like one clove, but actually it was sneaky and Turned into two cloves So it didn't look like it when you're planting it But it was actually two cloves and that's going to create two plants right next to each other again Not ideal because your spacing has dropped to zero inches instead of six inches uh, so Gently teasing one of them out of the soil, certainly if your soil is loose, you'll be able to tease out one of these guys and let the other one form up into a full-size bulb. So this green garlic stage is really quite fun um, to, to get that early harvest. You can keep doing that all the way through. There's, there's nothing to stop you harvesting garlic all the way through. Obviously, if you harvest all of your garlic at green stage, then you don't get any big garlic, which is usually most people's primary crop. Another... Another option here is when you plant your garlic cloves, in general, apologies for forgetting to mention this, people, the, the size of the clove is a little bit important. So massive cloves aren't going to grow massive bulbs. It, there's not a direct correlation there, they're genetically identical. But what is difference is like the amount of energy that this has to like shoot that garlic up in the first place and that's what we want. So if you're planting really, really small cloves, like this one, really small ones are gonna grow a garlic plant but you're gonna end up with a really, really small garlic bulb. So what some people do is they just don't bother planting that knowing that ahead of time. So they'll plant their medium to large planting stock as their cloves and then they'll put these to one side and you can go ahead and plant these as kind of like a spring onion crop in really early spring, maybe February. And by March and April, you're gonna be getting a scallion crop. And, and knowing that you're doing that intentionally, if you've got like a bucket of 30 of these little ones, you can go ahead and just plant them really densely. 
and in a very small space you can grow a bunch of these really delicious early garlicky scallion-esque vegetables. So that's, that's a pretty good tactic if you want to ramp up your garlic production. After that stage, uh, th this is, again, generalizations, let's say three to five weeks before garlic harvest time. So in my head, that's end of April going into May and maybe even beginning of June. There's quite a wide window in these garlics. You're going to get scape formation. So we saw the picture of the dried scape early on and the harvested scape. This is what it looks like as it comes out of the plant. So we've got the central stalk of the garlic, we've got the leaves, we've got the leaves, 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 and then out of the top set of leaves, you'll see this thing that doesn't look like a leaf. And you might be scared in the beginning, but it's just a garlic scape. It comes out, uh, this one, they have this wonderful kind of like pigtail effect as they grow, different varieties will grow straighter or more curly. And this is effectively the flower stalk. If you allow it to continue to grow until it's a little bit bigger, then this part here will open up into a garlic flower that looks a little bit like that uh, elephant garlic flower that we saw earlier, but white. So they're exciting and garlic flowers are beautiful. So if you wanna leave a few plants to go to flower, then that's totally fine. What you need to know is that in almost every study they've ever done on all different types of garlic, is if you leave the scape on for longer than you know six to eight inches of growth it's going to impact the size of your final bulb basically the plant is putting all its energy into flower production and not into bulb production and so this definitely definitely impacts your yields like up 25 to 50 percent impact on yields if you leave the scape on so whether or not you want to eat the scape as a, like a delicious spring a garlicky edible or not, you still need to go through the practice of breaking them off. So this is one of those garden activities. It's like weeding edibles, like lamb's quarter. If you go through weeding edibles, I just think of that as an it's, it's not weeding, it's harvesting. And this is harvesting, not maintenance. So it's a fun, it's a fun thing to do. And basically, it's kind of brittle so you can snap it off but you wanna snap it off as low down as you can possibly get. Because if you snap it off too high, then it can continue to regrow. So we are gonna snap it off uh, as low down as possible and end up with uh, just a really, really awesome harvest. So lots of scape, scape recipes out there. You can be very inspired next spring. Um, but just keep an eye on it because they don't necessarily all produce at the same time. So if you go through your harvest and get most of them and then forget about it for a week, you may come back and have these really long scapes that you know those bulbs aren't going to be as big a producing at that point. Okay, so we've gone through green harvest, through scape harvest. Once scapes form, only on hard necks, remember, that's not going to happen on the soft necks. We get to the point where beginner garlic growers might start getting concerned because we start seeing leaf dieback. But the leaf dieback is generally a good thing because what these bulbs are actually enclosed in is dried leaves. So the, the natural storage protection of the garlic is the dried leaves around. So these are drying back down, drying back down. And the general rule is, you can see in this field of garlic, we're looking for about half of the leaves to be dried down. So this will happen from the bottom up and we get this dry down, dry down, dry down, dry down. And we get to a point where about half of those leaves are dried down, which normally means you've got about three to five green leaves left. And that's when you want to harvest. So that's, that's the telltale sign. It's not so much saying like this is the date you harvest because it's so variety and environmentally determined but looking at the leaves is a sure way to tell and then if you're still a little bit unsure you can just go and dig one up and if it's still looking really small you can leave it another week and then dig another one up and kind of do a little test harvest to hopefully get to a point where we're harvesting garlic that's pretty well formed like most of them are well formed we can see the dried down leaves more clearly now linking into the skin and then the green stuff is still at top so at this stage the garlic's fairly fragile, so we want to make sure we treat it very gently. We don't want to leave it in the sun, so we're kind of just lifting it up, up with a fork. Don't worry about any dirt that's clung to it or anything like that. You're going to have roots on the bottom and all sorts of stuff. It, it's all good at that stage. You just collect it together into a bucket or a tray nice and gently, and you want to take it somewhere where it's 
this is, this is my storage garlic, uh, where it's cool, well ventilated, and out of direct sunlight. And there's so many different ways you can do this depending on how much garlic you've harvested, but this is just a very simple back and forth tray, ventilation through the bottom. I run a fan on this in my shed. So that's, that's my curing option, but there's, you, can, you can hang it, you can tie it, you can put it in a barn, in a garage, you can bring it inside and put it near an air conditioner. So, you know, all sorts of different ways, but ventilation is critical and keep it out of direct sunlight. And what's gonna happen, this is kind of like halfway done, you can see in that last picture, we had a lot of green and now we've progressed to the green is drying down. So this is the curing process. It can take, depending on how humid it is, anything from three to five weeks. And we get to a point where everything is totally green. And at that point, uh, you can begin braiding it. I brought a sample braid of a soft neck because it's easier to braid soft necks. I'm not gonna teach you how to braid, but you'll be amazed how many braiding YouTube videos there are out there. So braiding and hanging in your kitchen is a real fun thing you can do that you don't usually get to do if you're buying garlic because they've already cut it off. With my hard necks, I generally store by snipping half an inch to an inch left of stem. So I just leave that on there and they just go into a tray in my basement. So you don't have to keep the stalk on, but you do have to let it fully dry down before you do that because the garlic bulb is continuing to pull nutrients into its storage vessel. Okay, one last thing. Once you get fully dried out, you also wanna just cut the roots off. So I can show you on this one that's already been done. You just, they, they can be quite scraggly and we're gonna cut the roots off. So roots off, stem off, and you can store. Uh, or, or braid if you wanna leave, leave them all tied together. Okay, so that's kind of like, that's your whole growing cycle. We went from planting in October-ish and harvesting in June-ish. I've got this Chinese pink variety that I like so much because I harvest it about three weeks earlier than all other garlic. So that comes out of the ground around about mid to late May. But some other ones might go all the way to July before they're ready. So just be attentive during that time window. At this, at this point, you, you can eat garlic as soon as you harvest it. So if you don't wanna wait for the curing process, the garlic is totally edible at that stage. The curing process is what, what allows you to store the garlic. So sadly, I'm not gonna take you on a whole reconstructed tour of WNC Garlic Fest, because that could take all day. But just know that the creative ways that you can use garlic are immense. And we've had garlic ice cream, garlic cookies. We've had black garlic, which is a, like a molasses-like dehydrated garlic over a long period of time. We get uh, garlic hummus, roasted garlic sea salt, fermented garlic. It's, you know, just everything you can imagine. Uh, happens at Garlic Fest and it's a really fun thing. So when you end up with an abundance of garlic, just be open-minded about the ways that you can use it in an eating preparation. And then I wanna talk finally about storage because one of, the, one of the joys of growing garlic is it can be stored for such a long time. So as you, as you get more into gardening and start thinking about your whole annual cycle of food systems, then it's nice to know that you can actually grow a crop that will store for long enough to get you all the way through to the, the next crop. So we've already said that hard necks won't last as long as soft necks, so keep that in your brain as you're planning that out. But what you need to do is give them the ideal storage conditions after you've done curing to allow them to survive the best. And that basically means temperature and humidity. So we're looking for a temperature that's kind of around 40 to 50 Fahrenheit is good. 30 to 40 Fahrenheit is kind of the temperature, sorry, I got that wrong. 40 to 50 Fahrenheit is when you tend to get sprouting on garlic. So we're looking for warmer than that or colder than that. And most people find that if they put it in the refrigerator, that's perfect sprouting temperatures. So they don't, they don't do that or we don't recommend you do that. Or if you've bought store-bought garlic and you put it in your refrigerator and it sprouted, you now know why. That's kind of like the ideal sprouting temperature. So if we can get it in normal room temperature conditions, they tend to be pretty good. If you can get it a little bit cooler, like basement, root cellar, wine cellar conditions, then that's even better because you're kind of getting closer to that 50 mark without being too cool. So temperature is one of the main things that will allow you to store garlic for the longest. 
Uh, and then humidity is kind of important. If it's too dry, then the bulbs lose their moisture really quickly and they shrivel. So you might have seen shriveled garlic, and that's generally too dry. If they're too humid, then you promote fungal diseases and rot and mold, and that's an issue as well. So you're looking for pr pretty normal house conditions. So, you know, like 60, 70% humidity tends to be okay. So not too wet, not too dry. And with them in good storage conditions, you're gonna wanna keep an eye on them throughout the whole season, certainly your longer stored garlic. So as, it, as it's been in storage for longer, it's gonna deteriorate more and you wanna pull out the ones that are starting to get soft and either turn them into some delicious preparation like dried and powdered garlic or honey fermented garlic. And I'll leave you to Google those ones um, or just go ahead and eat them straight away because you know that they're not gonna store for much longer before they shrivel to nothing. So that's kind of your whole garlic cycle from planting to eating and storing. Uh, I just very quickly want to throw out, this is a crazy biblical book on garlic, which will tell you everything you want to know if you want to go back and reference if you're a book person. And this is Ira Wallace, who works at Seed Savers Exchange. She's a bit of a allium aficionado, and she's written a book specifically for North Carolina. So if we've got a lot of North Carolina people out there, then that's pretty awesome. It's not about garlic, it's about vegetable growing, but she's got some good allium sections. So I am going to leave you there. This is me if you want to know more about the Utopian Sea Project and the ongoing garlic trials and myself at Blue and Yellow Mix. Thank you so much. Chris, we have a question. Oh. She asked, she said you explained it well, but she was distracted by her kid. So will you please repeat the section about pruning out the scape? Oh, yeah. It's actually really easy. Um, you. The scape comes out of the top two leaves and it's gonna kind of pigtail around. You wanna wait till it's about six to eight inches long and that's gonna have a really good tender eating stage and means that you've not distracted too much energy from bulb production. And you can go in with scissors and snip down low. You can snap it pretty cleanly and you just wanna go as low down as possible without damaging the plant so that it doesn't re-sprout. If it does re-sprout, just go ahead and clip it again. Um, uh, twin. Uh, Twin Oaks Farm, which is a community up in Virginia, they have competitions in their field to see who can pull the longest scape out by getting it as low as possible without damaging the plant. So, yeah. Um, you mentioned elephant garlic. I know you mentioned you're going to talk about it tomorrow as well. But yeah. is there a climate that's better for that? You mentioned soft necks are better in more southern states and mm -hmm. hard necks more northern. What's the deal for elephant garlic? Yeah, good question. Um, elephant garlic will grow pretty much anywhere you can grow either of the garlics. It's a little, it, it will bolt like a hard neck, so you generally get escape from it and that flower that we saw on the slide. Uh, but yeah, it'll, it'll grow in, in both climates quite happily. I, if we're going to quickly talk about elephant garlic, <laughs> it's so big, it actually needs wider spacing. So same pattern, but 12 inch spacing instead of 6 inch spacing will uh, get you the good sized elephant garlic bulbs. That's it. Thank you. Cool. No worries. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Please come back tomorrow, same time, same place. If you've registered, we will be sending you an email twice, once this afternoon and once tomorrow morning with the direct links. And also, there's been a lot of great books mentioned today. And Breeze and Chris's, if you scroll down into the notes section, there are direct links to their books as well. So thank you for joining us. Thank you.